shelf without any loss of energy. If you don't toss it high enough, it won't reach the shelf. And if you toss it too high, uh, it'll hit the shelf with a bang as it falls down from its, the highest point. And so uh, you only get the band gap energy out. So if you look at my patents, what happens is I divide the light into different colors and then design a specific circuit that takes out the energy very efficiently at that band gap. And then we actually had some stuff done at Boeing Spectra Lab. I started talking to people who build solar cells, and I found out that only my buddies who worked at Boeing, who graduated with me, understood what the hell I was talking about. And maybe they're the only ones that took the time to to listen to me. But um, so we built some multispectral cells and actually the ultra triple junction cell out of Boeing Spectral Lab as part of that. Uh, the Spectral Lab division of Boeing makes uh, solar cells for satellites like the International Space Station. So we built a, we built a triple junction cell that was 35 percent efficient. And uh, we then uh, developed some six junction cells, which they're not permitted to build right now. Uh, under our agreement, but there's some six junction cells that can that can be 55 percent efficient. The other thing that we do is you have to load the uh, load each cell so that it's at the peak power point for that particular junction. So it's a pretty complicated system, but it's not complicated compared to say a computer chip, but it is complicated in comparison to a a, a 1950s style solar cell, which is only about 20% efficient at most. So, and some of the ones that, that go to really low cost uh, are only 5% efficient. So it's not really the, it's not the efficiency. Efficiency can be important, but it's the cost and the efficiency. And so one of the things that, that I do, which, which uh, others are starting to catch on to a little bit, is, and there's about 25 companies out there that are doing a variety of things in the solar field like this. But they focus light at a very high intensity. So if you read the paper, I don't know if you saw the Boeing paper, the study that I have online. Yes, I read it. We, we have 5,000 times the, 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 the last two pages are the most important ones, I guess. Uh, operating at 5,000 times solar intensity, we can produce electricity at 5 cents per peak watt. So uh, that's our power rating, and that means our, our energy per kilowatt hour. Now, we are 55% efficient, and that the efficiency helps, but the real, the real help comes from uh, the innovations, not, this is, which is why this is online, and I, there's other things that are not. But the thing that really makes it low cost is we just have a couple of sheets of plastic that are precision molded, and we bond those together with thermal uh, fuse. It's just... Uh, Thermal heating, uh, we uh, we melt plastic. This is a thermoplastic, so it remelts and and welds easy, and and uh, fill that with water, and uh, so we have these little photocells sitting at these focal points of these lenses that are intercepting the light and uh, directly producing hydrogen and oxygen right there there at the cell, and uh, we have some designs for electrodes on these on these little cells that are shaped like little wedges. Um, and this is, there are a lot of innovations that some of them we haven't issued patents yet. We've done some preliminary patent work on, but for example, we produce hydrogen and oxygen bubbles on our electrodes, but we shape the electrode, we, we shape cavities in the electrodes so that when the bubbles form, they form on one end and as they expand, they shoot off. And that's done by a little wedge. <laughs> um, if you, and if you're talking to very elegant people, you say, well, I was looking at a glass of champagne when I thought of this. But if you're, if you're talking <laughs> to others, you might say I was looking at a glass of beer. But in either case, when you look at bubbles in a, in a glass of champagne or a glass of beer, you'll notice that there are streams of bubbles coming from a specific spot in the glass. Mm -hmm. And they're all the same size. They're all equally spaced, and they're all following one another. How does that happen? And it happens because there's a spot, there's a defect in the glass that causes carbon dioxide to come out of solution at that point at a specific rate. And when the bubble is larger, is large enough inside so that the hydrostatic forces are greater than the ten surface tension holding it to the glass, it breaks away. Immediately, it starts, CO2 starts to form again, and this, this bubble rises. And a few seconds, micro, milliseconds later, another bubble releases. So you have a whole series of bubbles. They're all the same size. They're all equally spaced. They're all following the same path. 
So immediately I realized in looking at that that we could engineer bubbles. So we designed electrodes that would cause the elect just not hydrogen and oxygen to form randomly, but for hydrogen and oxygen to form at specific points and in a wedge. And as it expanded, the wedge acted like an engine to push the bubbles forward. Mm. And that way we could, we, with very little equipment, basically we just use a wafer fab to build these little dots. But basically these dots, when they're exposed to light sitting in water, shoot out a stream of oxygen in one direction and a stream of hydrogen in the other. And we, and we, we mold into the plastic a header system to collect that stream. And that header system also delivers fresh water the other way, so there's bubbles going up and water coming down. And the system works great. It's, it's a very low-cost system. You do need a wafer fab and a, and a supply chain to set it up, about a billion and a half dollars. But if you're doing a $10 billion or $20 billion oil deal, it's, it's peanuts. <laughs> uh, yes. Of course, if you're, if you're going to the venture capital market and using the totally inappropriate venture capital model, which everyone is being forced to use these days, um, it's ridiculous. It's a ridiculous sum of money. But um, if we do an oil deal where we're converting coal into oil and the fallback position is we'll just use the straight Burgess process without any solar input, but, but by by allowing the hydrogen, you know, the hydrogen input as a as an option, we can get the one and a half billion to build the supply chain. And if we if we meet our price points, which I think we will, then we we make oil at eight dollars a barrel. If we don't meet our price point, we have a great solar factory that reaches some price point, probably better than any other, and then we can enter directly into the market. In fact, we we talked to GE when they were before they bought. Uh, before they created GE Solar, and we uh, we organized a deal with them that if we did this oil deal um, and we failed to meet our price points, well, we'd enter the market at sixteen dollars a barrel instead of eight, and they'd buy our factory from us. So we had, you know, these these deals can get done, it's but they can't get done as a research project, you know, from a university or as a venture capital project like uh, you're doing some sort of software development for its, for a cell phone app or something. You've got to have serious money and, and serious, you know, as you can see from some of my stuff, mm-hmm. we've put a lot of time and effort into designing factories, designing the supply chain, and all these other things. But, yeah, we, the 55% efficiency is very high. It's about the highest you can, you can reasonably achieve from a, from a white light source like the sun. And, um, but, We've done our, you know, we've done our homework. But it's not yeah. the efficiency; it's the cost. It's the cost of that of that power. We can produce hydrogen for eighty dollars a ton from nine tons of water, nine kiloliters of water. So, uh, at that price, we're the cheapest fuel on the planet, and the best use of it initially is to make coal into petrol. And then, once that's developed, then we uh, we had a whole plan. I don't know. Did you look at the sun va- sun valve? Sunoco Valero stuff. Oh, you, I you, certainly do. Uh, you buy a retailer. Uh, once you have an oil supply that's low cost, then you can buy a retailer that doesn't have an oil supply. Merge the two, and you've created a huge amount of value. Um, once you have a retail outlet, then you can start um, selling hydrogen at, at pumps. Uh, you can partner with Ford or Chevy or somebody like that, Toyota, whoever, and uh, start start putting out twenty, thirty thousand stations with hydrogen pumps, and just sell the hydrogen because the hydrogen is a lot cheaper than than screwing around with the coal, right? So if you're doing eight dollars a barrel, uh, you do a straight Burgess process for about sixteen dollars a barrel. Add the solar hydrogen; it's about eight dollars a barrel. Just sell the hydrogen by itself; it's four dollars a barrel equivalent, right? You, you get a certain amount of heat burning hydrogen as you do oil, and the equivalent's about $4 a barrel equivalent. So um, you're, you're always pushing the price down, right, with this technology, which yes. is where you want it, which is what you want to do if you're not dealing with artificial scarcity. If you're dealing with, oh, I'm going to make a profit from delivering something productive to people rather than I'm going to make a profit by stealing things from people. That's the difference. <laughs> so, oh, and, indeed. And, and, and this is, you know, the veils are off here. We, uh, we're seeing this. We're seeing this now, William. I'm surprised. I'm surprised that uh, you know you haven't been <laughs> cutted off in a little black box at this point with your your technology. Have you done uh, any public demonstrations with this, William? 
Um, I, we've, I've built uh, 30 different prototypes, and we've um, uh, had uh, a number of demonstrations for investors and things like that. Um, I had, at one point, I had a machine shop in Ohio, and um, we lost all of our customers, and we were forced to sell that machine shop. I took all the, all the um, working models and things like that, put them in storage, and then that was vandalized. So um, other, some other things have happened in terms of my finances, which we've spent $15 million building all that stuff, and I don't have $15 million to reproduce it. So uh, the only thing I have are reports like from top-tier companies who you know, put out a solid report on what we're doing. Right. Yes. So so right now, yeah, I don't have that sort of thing, but it doesn't it, it, it's sort of like saying, well, um, I don't have any oil from this oil field, but the geology looks good. And let's drill. Let's do a test drilling. Right. Right now. Yes. So so we this is what I'm doing right now is I'm uh, talking to some coal companies about coal, converting it to petrol and selling it to some buyers of marine fuel here in New Zealand. Doesn't use any solar at all. The value that I'll retain from that will allow me to rebuild some of this stuff and start down this path again. Excellent, excellent. And um, and William, with the solar panels, the solar energy. This is a question that I've had for a long time. Developing this sort of technology with the use of the chemtrails. I mean, you know, in in Britain, for instance, they have sixty percent sunlight than they had in the sixties. How, how would this affect your system? Well, um, the level of radiation, uh, you, you're, you're affecting the uh, number of photons. And so the number of photons are reduced, so the number of electrons are reduced, so the amount of material is reduced for a given. In, uh, at night, you're not producing anything. If it's cloudy, um, you're producing less. Uh, systems that focus, uh, if you, uh, well, so if you're, so if you're producing 60% of the light, or if 60% of the light is being scattered, then it's not going to be able to be focused the same way as if the, you, it was in a clear sky. So you would have a 40% reduction. But the cost, that means the cost goes from $80 a ton to, uh, you know, $120 a ton, something like that, which is still what by far less expensive than um, the amount of, you know, uh, than oil or coal today. Yes. So we can, I don't, I can't see enough uh, material being injected into the atmosphere through geoengineering to uh, make this untenable or unworkable. It just increases the cost slightly. And I would say that, that even at the levels that th things are being injected today, that um, it's a drawing a unwanted attention, negative attention from the public, and I can't see this thing. I can't see myself making long-term plans with that in mind. That is, it to the degree that it is happening, it won't happen for long. Um, you know, it, if you're if you're doing a small amount of geoengineering or geoengineering research covertly, that you know that you might get away with that, but uh, doing it over decades doing it enough to reduce the sunlight to, you know, 10% or something would, would have a severe backlash and would not be sustainable uh, or workable over a long period of time. So um, I see that as a, I don't see that as a strategic worry. Um, uh, it, it can have adverse impact. Um, it can't, there are things that, that you do have to worry about in terms of productivity, but um, it affects the price point. It doesn't affect the workability of the whole system. Okay. Okay, so so in a nutshell, it would <clears throat> alter the um, the price to to the, you know, it would alter the price, end of story, um, it, up the price a little. It's insanity yeah. really, isn't it? We, we, we're sitting here <laughs> under mass clouds. I've got, we've got the first clear day we've had in a very long time. Uh, um, my gardens are being flooded out. You know, I've had three attempts at planting uh, this season, and uh, still people aren't seeing uh, the effects of this geoengineering, and, and many not seeing it at all. So, 
know, to have these alternative systems, I'm I'm amazed that this hasn't been jumped at. But you know, as as I said earlier, we we've got the text and oil companies moving in. There's been two thirds of New Zealand is marked out now for oil and mineral uh, raping, and uh, you know. Yeah, I think I think that um, I think that that sort of thing. Um, I don't think those things are tenable either. One of the reasons I like New Zealand is that um, they are so far removed from everybody that there is a sort of a tariff to haul things away from New Zealand. So you might get, you might sign a good deal, but if the oil supply is interrupted, you may find that nobody has the oil to send a ship down here or that, or that if they do, it has a huge price associated with it. So I think this tends because of the ge- geographic isolation of New Zealand. I think that's a benefit. You might, if you look at the history of the United States and of Germany, actually, and of France, too, um, they had high tariffs at some point in their past. Switzerland has always had sort of a high tariff due to the mountain range around it. They're ringed by mountains. And so it's hard to trade with, with, with Switzerland. And it's interesting that Switzerland is one of the wealthiest countries on Earth. Uh, Germany, during its buildup before the First World War, had very high tariffs, and it d- helped develop its industry. You say, wow, these Germans really know a lot of things. They, they know how to build things. And the reason they know how to build things is they had a tariff at a point in their history, and they developed the skills, and they didn't let those skills go. Yeah. And, and France, the same way. So uh, the United States, after the Civil War and before World War I, had high tariffs. And the, the people who argued for high tariffs all got shot as President McKinley, and, uh, who was a uh, Cleveland, and, um, um, you know, in addition to Lincoln. So, you know, they, they argued for our own currency, whether fiat currency like Lincoln wanted or gold-backed currency based on California gold rush or the Alaskan gold rush. Um, they, they fought for an independent United States. And our great industries sprang up in that period. It was only after that period that they eroded during the period of so-called free trade. It's not really free if a few small groups of people control it. It's not free at all. They just call it free. Um, So tariffs are a good thing if they're properly managed. Um, They can be a bad thing, but generally speaking, uh, raping a country through the through the illusion of free trade, is not a way to build wealth for a country. The good news for New Zealand is that they're so geographically isolated that when the oil supply is reduced and oil prices run up, all of those agreements, you might notice that those companies are second-tier companies or divisions within companies that are second-tier. There will be... So so if you look at the global scene, and I know a few of the, the way some of these companies are structured... You know, the companies themselves, like Shell Oil Company, for example, they're, very, they're a large global conglomerate. Some of those divisions will no longer be useful uh, in a world of $800 a barrel oil. And so, sure, they'll, they'll go off and sign a deal with New Zealand, but they haven't really thought it through because at $800 a barrel, nobody's going to haul um, a ton of lumber out of New Zealand or a ton of steel or a ton of coal. You're not going to be able to haul a ton of coal anywhere at any reasonable price at when oil is at $800 a barrel and there's no marine fuel anyway. This is why I'm interested in marine fuel here. So my feeling is that um, uh, if, the worst, if the worst happens, all these trade agreements will be worthless to those people. And those will be the divisions that, or the companies that will go by the wayside anyway. Um, what New Zealanders have to worry about is, is how to handle the deficit of oil each day. Their economy is being uh, ruined because they're paying for that oil, and it's and the absence of that oil is a big, big issue. Right now, um, 170,000 barrels a day of oil is being imported. I mean, I'm sorry, 170,000 barrels a day is being used. 90,000 barrels a day is being imported. The balance is being homegrown locally. So, the New Zealand economy will survive an oil crisis. Um, the thing that interests me is that 
there's a lot of coal right now being hauled off to China and India to support their industry. And that coal can be converted to oil using my process. And so I think we could make a stand here. A 200,000 barrel a day refinery could be built at Montanui um, yes. where they had the uh, coal liquefaction. I mean, the uh, I'm sorry, the gas liquefaction process there making methanol. Um, when the gas well ran out, um, the, that was shut down. It's not, it's not really being well used today, but it could be acquired in, in this type of environment we're imagining, and that, that that would allow us to convert coal on a large scale to petrol, and then we would export petrol into a petrol star.